you see, uh, 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 there are a few things which I uh, want you to notice at this point. Um, the first thing is that <coughs> um, you know we have we have the extended complex plane, which consists of the complex plane plus the point at infinity, okay, and uh, the point at infinity, how it is thought of concretely as a point on a space is by identifying it with the north pole on the Riemann sphere via the stereographic projection which gives you a homeomorphism between the Riemann sphere okay which is the unit sphere in 3 space centered at the origin okay and the complex plane along with the point at infinity and that is external complex plane. <coughs> Therefore, <coughs> see therefore you are able to think of uh, you are able to think of the point at infinity as the uh, as the north pole uh, uh, under this correspondence which is given by the stereographic projection. Now, so you know if you just imagine only the uh, complex plane the point at infinity seems to be a, an invisible point okay it seems to be far away and uh, out of uh, you know out of sight if you want it is something that you cannot visualize okay. But then the way you should really think about it is you must remember that the point at infinity is an interior point okay of the extended complex plane. Mind you of course for that matter any point in a topological space is an interior point because uh, that point is al al always contained in the whole topological space which by definition is an open set a point in a topological space is called is called an interior point of a set if it contains uh, there there is an open set which contains that point and which is contained in the given set okay so in that sense uh, of course every point in, a, in any topological space is certainly an interior point of the topological space but what i want you to understand is that uh, in general an interior point uh, you should be able to you, you should be able to talk about a deleted neighborhood of an interior point and the fact is that if you take the extended complex plane and you take the point at infinity if you throw away infinity what you get is a complex plane and the complex plane itself is a deleted neighborhood of infinity that is what I want you to understand. So when you are looking at the complex plane you are looking at the deleted at, at a deleted neighborhood of infinity that is what you must understand okay and of course if you are looking at as we defined just now. Uh, if you look at the exterior of a circle then you are actually getting a smaller neighborhood of infinity and the neighbor neighborhood becomes smaller and smaller as the circle becomes larger and larger okay that is how it goes and there is one more so, so you must get used to thinking of infinity as an interior point with a deleted neighborhood of infinity uh, being thought of as uh, the uh, exterior of a circle in the complex plane okay and all this is uh, all this is not just imagination it is it is concretely correct okay because uh, this is what you really see when you translate it in terms of the stereographic projection and look at what is happening on the Riemann sphere. The, ex the point at infinity appears as on the Riemann sphere as a as a honest point it, it is a north pole okay and a neighborhood of infinity is going to be an exterior of a circle on the complex plane and that appears honestly as a open uh, neighborhood of the north pole on the uh, Riemann sphere. And for that matter if you take the whole complex plane uh, under the stereographic projection it will go to the whole Riemann sphere minus the north pole. So uh, uh, saying that the whole complex plane is a deleted neighborhood of the point at infinity amounts to uh, saying in terms of the stereographic projection that the whole sphere minus the north pole is a deleted neighborhood of the north pole which is correct okay. So what I am trying to tell you is that the stereographic projection allows you to really think concretely okay. So uh, and this is very very important because you see if I want to think of infinity as a point okay then where is that point how do I see it. So the the, the the idea is that uh, you see it as a as a north pole on the uh, stereographic projection okay and then there is one more thing uh, normally when you uh, are studying properties of a function 
when you do analysis. Normally what you do is that you study uh, the properties of the function at, uh, at an interior point and the reason is because you want to uh, basically what you do in analysis is that you study limits and uh, to study limits you will have to take limits in all possible directions. So you, if you want to st uh, behave, study the behaviour of a function at a point then you should be able to study the limit of the function as you approach that point in all possible directions and uh, uh, namely you have to look at function values close to that point in all possible directions around that point. So you, basically you want the function to be defined in a deleted neighbourhood of that point okay otherwise you cannot do this okay and that is the reason why you need an interior point if you want to really do analysis okay and of course uh, taking a limit uh, starts with continuity and then even uh, derivative is a limit and so on and so forth okay. Uh, now you see uh, what about the point at infinity you can ask uh, uh, is it also true of for the point at infinity that you are uh, uh, you are able to approach it from all directions and the answer is yes you see you take uh, though the, if you look at the complex plane the the, uh, the point at infinity is not visible okay but you must always think in terms of the Riemann sphere and the north pole as uh, as representing the point at infinity under the stereographic projection. So you know you how do you approach uh, uh, how is it correct to say that you know you are able to approach infinity from all directions. So you you can think of approaching infinity by going along a curve uh, on the complex plane which uh, going to an unbounded part of the curve okay and uh, for example you can take straight lines passing through the origin and then you as you move away from the origin on the line you can think that you are approaching infinity and you can think that you know as you change the lines you are approaching infinity in different directions okay. So the truth is that uh, all this will agree if you translate it in terms of the stereographic projection okay. So uh, if you look at it in terms of stereographic projection you will see that uh, you are actually approaching uh, the north pole you know from various directions okay. So if you want I uh, just to uh, just to help you uh, uh, think about it so here so let me let me draw this again so you know basically you have you have uh, the complex plane here this is the these are the x and y uh, axis and this is the complex plane thought of as x y plane in uh, R3 okay and of course as we have done before uh, we are not going to call the third axis as z we are calling it as u because z is supposed to stand for x plus i y okay and uh, the, the stereographic projection is basically you draw this circle uh, I mean you draw the sphere centered at the origin radius 1 unit and look at the surface of the sphere and uh, uh, so so basically I have here this is this is my circle on the complex plane this is the unit circle on the complex plane centered 0 uh, uh, centered at 0 radius 1 unit and then I have this uh, this sphere which is a Riemann sphere uh, well in fact this uh, is supposed to meet on the x axis uh, so let me see where I can change that uh, okay fine so, <coughs> so here is how it is and now you see yeah so on the complex plane if I want to approach the point at infinity what I do is that I can I can go uh, along a ray okay uh, and move away that moves away from the origin okay and as you move further and further along the ray I am supposed to be going to infinity okay and uh, well and, and the direction of the ray uh, is supposed to give one of the directions in which I can approach infinity okay so and, and, and why is this is correct why is this correct this is because you see if you take the image of uh, this ray under the stereographic projection okay what you will actually get is that you will you will basically get you will get you will basically get this uh, uh, under the see mind you uh, so let me uh, let me remind you see you have the north pole here okay the stereographic projection is done in the following way you give me um, give me any point or uh, give me any point on the sphere okay. Uh, then that point is mapped uh, by the stereographic projection to its image phi of p and that is done by simply joining the north pole to that point and uh, looking at the uh, point where this line uh, hits the uh, plane okay. So, the, so here is uh, so phi is the uh, stereographic projection 
okay. And now you can see that under the stereographic projection the origin uh, goes uh, 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 the, 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 uh, the south pole of the sphere goes to the origin. Okay. So, the origin corresponds to the south pole, the south pole on the sphere corresponds to what point on the plane it corresponds to the origin because it is supposed to correspond to the point on the plane which is gotten by joining the south pole to the north pole by a line and look at looking at where that line hits the complex plane and so the south pole corresponds to the origin okay. and now you can see that the, the uh, 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 you know the, the image of this uh, of this ray okay is going to be is going to be this this circular arc like this this is what i'm going to get okay on the uh, uh, you know that is uh, that's what i'm going to get on the uh, on the riemann sphere okay and mind you if i move uh, this phi of p further and further towards infinity the point p moves further and further along that great circle uh, to the north pole okay so you see basically what is happening is that uh, you you are going like this uh, so th this is how it's going okay and the fact is that if you if you had taken uh, if you had taken another direction okay then you are uh, you will see that you are that does correspond to going approaching the north pole on the sphere in another direction okay so uh, so for example if so so let me let me draw that uh, uh, you can easily imagine it, but uh, it is good to draw a few diagrams now and then. So, you know if I if I for example, uh, were to take a line like this, uh, suppose I were where uh, and mind you these this green this green line and this uh, uh, this violet line that I have drawn, they are uh, in fact uh, uh, supposed to lie on the x y plane, mind you they are lines on the plane, they are rays on the plane and I am drawing them to indicate that a point is moving towards infinity. Okay. So, if you uh, look at this, uh, this violet line that I have drawn okay, that is going to the left of the diagram, then what is its image under the stereographic projection that corresponds to again you know uh, a, a, a circle like this, a great circle like this uh, which is going like this okay. and that is again uh, another, uh, so you know if I, if, I, if I take a point Q here uh, it will under the stereographic projection it will it will go to uh, 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 to phi of q uh, so it will go to phi of q and you know as phi of q moves uh, to away and away from the origin which is supposed to be thought of as going to infinity then uh, q on the riemann sphere is going to move closer and closer to the north pole okay so uh, so you see that uh, uh, if you look at uh, points on rays starting from the origin and moving towards uh, mo moving towards the point at infinity namely moving away from the origin they do correspond to different directions of approaching the north pole on the Riem on the riemann sphere okay under the stereographic projection therefore what i'm trying to say is that i'm trying to say that uh, uh, this e the point at infinity can be approached in all directions okay uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, justification you can give thanks to the stereographic projection okay so if you if you let uh, the variable z to go to infinity along an arc or a path or a ray uh, or a even a curve, curve which is unbounded and going to infinity then you are going to infinity okay uh, in a certain direction and uh, you can do this in many ways and that amounts to uh, uh, really approaching infinity from all directions and the way you see it is that you see it on the uh, Riemann sphere okay using the stereographic projection. So, you must understand concretely that you know thinking of infinity as a concrete point, thinking of a neighborhood of infinity, thinking of small neighborhoods of infinity okay and then thinking of being uh, uh, thinking of being able to approach infinity from different directions all this is concretely possible and it is because of the stereographic projection that is that is the important thing okay fine. So, now with all this uh, uh, let me again continue with this uh, with the with the string of definitions which I wanted to give. So, one definition was to 
uh, tell you that uh, uh, I've, that I've already done. I've defined what limit as z tends to uh, 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 infinity uh, of uh, f of z uh, means. Okay, so I've defined uh, what it means to take a limit at infinity. Okay, which is what I did last time. So if you want, uh, if we look at it, uh, so here is here is a definition. Uh, we define a uh, limit z tends to infinity for z in uh, the external complex plane as uh, uh, going to uh, uh, al uh, z as allowing the modulus of z to become arbitrarily large okay which is written by this condition mod z greater than r and that is uh, essentially you know it is a, it is the exterior of a circle and that you know as r becomes larger and larger corresponds to a smaller and smaller neighborhood of infinity if you look at infin if, if you look at it via the stereographic projection and therefore you know we define limit z tends to infinity f of z equal to lambda uh, where lambda is a complex number uh, to mean the obvious thing that as z approaches infinity f of z should approach lambda so which means that the distance between f of z and lambda namely this quantity can be made as small as you want provided you make z close to infinity sufficiently close to infinity and that is reflected by choosing this delta okay and and the hypothesis is that there is a delta given an epsilon okay so now this is how you define limit z tends to infinity uh, so this corresponds to getting a finite limit at infinity okay you are getting a limit at infinity but the limit is finite okay now i'm going to tell you the other thing the the the, the other two possibilities i'm going to look at the situation when you can get an infinite limit at a finite point in the complex plane that is one more case and then the third case is when you get an infinite limit at the point at infinity okay. So there are three definitions and all of them are, are, are important so, so, so let me make that uh, let me make that definition uh, we define uh, limit uh, z tends to z0 f of z is equal to infinity okay. Uh, uh, if given uh, epsilon greater than 0 uh, there exists a delta greater there exists a delta greater than 0 there exists a delta positive such that uh, the distance between f and infinity can be made lesser than epsilon uh, provided I make the distance between z and z0 lesser than delta. So let us let us translate that uh, so, uh, uh, so let me write it in quotes uh, distance uh, between f and infinity f of z and infinity uh, can be made smaller than epsilon. Uh, whenever uh, mod z minus z0 is less than delta okay and now uh, you know it is a little bit uh, 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 I am I'm just trying to say that f the values of f uh, namely fz they get closer to infinity and I want to say that they are closer to infinity by epsilon but then you know uh, if you want to really talk about distance you must have uh, some notion of distance between the point at infinity and a point on the plane okay only then you can talk about distance between infinity and a finite point okay. Now it happens that it can be done okay what you can do is you can define a distance between the point at infinity and the point in the and a point in the complex plane in the following very clever way and the, of course the key is the stereographic projection it gives you everything. So what you do is you take the point at infinity and you take the take any other point take their images on the stereographic projection you will get the north pole and some other point on the sphere and then you take the distance and and again for the distance you can you have two choices one is either you can take the distance in r3 of those two points on uh, on the surface of the sphere or you can take the uh, you can take the geodesic which is supposed to be the uh, uh, this it's going to be the circle uh, circular arc of 
shortest length that connects those two on the sphere okay. So these respectively will give you the uh, R3 the usual metric in R3 and the other one is called the uh, the usual metric in R3 is called the chordal metric because you are taking two points on the sphere and then you are joining them by a straight line segment that is going to be a chord and you are just measuring the length of the chord and the other thing is called the, uh, the spherical metric. The spherical metric is you are, you, are, you are moving on the surface of the sphere and you are taking the shortest distance and that shortest distance is going to be the length of the circular arc along the circle, uh, uh, the, the circle, the great circle that passes through these two points, okay. So, uh, uh, and then what you can do is you can, you can take that as a de your definition of distance of two points in the, com in the, in the extended complex plane and the, 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 the beautiful thing that happens is that with this, uh, the extended complex plane in fact even becomes a metric space, okay. And whether you put the chordal metric or whether you put the spherical metric, you get iso you, you, you get isomorphic metric spaces, okay. And in fact, uh, the topology induced by these metrics is the topology uh, on the extended complex plane given by the one point compactification which we see which we saw last time. So the, these are all facts that you can really write down and verify, okay. Because you are in three dimensions, you can even write down the stereographic projection in terms of x, y and u coordinates, okay. You can write down the stereographic projection, you can verify all these statements, okay. But uh, you know, here is where we will not be so concerned about distance, okay. We will interpret this fact that the distance between f and infinity can be made sufficiently small by simply saying that uh, f is in a sufficiently small neighborhood of infinity, okay. So you know that the, this is where the uh, this is where you try to escape from having to uh, do the more complicated job of trying to give a distance between a point between the point at infinity and a point on the complex plane. What you do is that you say that the uh, you say that f of z values of f are closer to infinity are 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 as, are, are as close as you want, and now that means that you know you you modify this statement to say that the uh, 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 f of z lies in a uh, very small neighborhood of the point at infinity and what is a very small neighborhood of the point at infinity it is, it is given by of course you know the exterior of a circle of sufficiently large radius and how large well you can make it to be inversely proportional to epsilon, okay. Because epsilon is supposed to be sufficiently small if you want you can make 1 by epsilon to be uh, the, uh, uh, the large radius. So you know, so we, we, we will replace this you know. Uh, uh, to mean the following thing, uh, uh, so we will make it mean that mod f z can be made greater than 1 by epsilon, okay. So, uh, uh, so you know this is the replacement I am trying to, uh, uh, this is the replacement for the definition uh, of trying to actually have a distance between a point at the value f z and the point at infinity and having that made less than epsilon. Okay. So, th so this is where you have to pay attention as to how the definitions and, and this, this, is, this is intuitively correct because you see if you, if epsilon is sufficiently small, okay, then you know uh, 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 1 by epsilon is pretty large, okay. And then mod fz greater than 1 by epsilon means that you are going to a sufficiently small neighborhood of the point at infinity, this is what you have to understand, okay. So it is, so here the, the, the fact is that you know epsilon is actually not the distance, okay. Uh, you should not think of it uh, uh, you know verbatim like that. You must think of it as going to uh, going outside a circle of very large radius and you if you want you can make that radius to be inversely proportional to epsilon, okay. So uh, see uh, uh, so this is what it means for us, okay. Uh, uh, so with so you know with uh, with this definition uh, you you know uh, what it means to say that uh, uh, so here of course i should say that uh, uh, z not is a complex number it's a finite complex number so this is how you define uh, a function taking the value infinity at a finite point z not okay and this is something that you've already seen uh, for example whenever a function has an has an isolated singularity which is a pole, then the limit of the function as you approach the pole is infinity. I mean this is what we always write and we interpret it to say to saying that the modulus of the function approaches infinity and 
uh, what is another way of saying that the modulus of the function approaches infinity it is just saying this namely that the modulus of the function uh, becomes arbitrarily large okay and that is what it that is what mod fz greater than 1 by epsilon says okay. So uh, so uh, so here is an example uh, if you know f of z has a pole uh, at uh, z equal to z0 in the complex plane then uh, limit uh, as z tends to z0 of f of z is actually infinity okay and uh, uh, now you see you can really think of infinity uh, as a point and you are saying that the function takes the limit the limiting value uh, is that point okay okay. So, so this is how you get an infinite limit at a finite point okay then there is a third case which is when you get an infinite limit at the point at infinity okay that is the third case. So uh, and, and why is that important that is important because I want to think of uh, uh, infinity as a pole for a function okay you know at if you want to think of a point as a pole then you know the function should tend to infinity as you approach that point. So if I want to think of infinity as a pole then the function should tend to infinity as I approach infinity. So I want an infinite limit at infinity okay so that is the motivation for the and the necessity for the next definition uh, so let me use a different color uh, okay so uh, uh, um, just a moment yeah uh, we define limit z tends to infinity f of z is equal to infinity now how do you define this. So again the uh, uh, I mean well you know if you uh, really try to use the epsilon delta definition you will say that uh, I want the values of f of z to come to uh, within an epsilon distance of infinity uh, given any epsilon uh, uh, however small for z sufficiently close to infinity okay. So here again you know you have to uh, so the moment you say distance from infinity mind you uh, the way out is that there is no distance from infinity as it is either you will have to do the hard work of defining distance from infinity to a point by going to the stereographic projection and taking either the caudal metric or the spherical metric and instead of doing all that we can be very topological and we can say that whenever you want to say uh, you are going close to infinity you are going to a neighborhood of infinity and that is very easy to define it is the exterior of a circle of sufficiently large radius. So you know in that in that sense what does this mean this means that you know uh, uh, given uh, uh, you can get uh, the values of f of z can get as close to infinity as you want provided z gets as close to infinity uh, sufficiently close to infinity that is what it means okay. So you know uh, so, so how do you write it down uh, by now you should have got it so let me write this down uh, provided uh, given uh, epsilon greater than 0 there exists delta greater than 0 such that uh, mod fz is greater than 1 by epsilon okay this is supposed to mean that f is going close to infinity because mind you uh, you must think of epsilon becoming smaller so 1 by epsilon is becoming larger and mod fz greater than 1 by epsilon is saying that you are in a smaller neighborhood of the point at infinity okay provide uh, whenever mod z is greater than 1 by delta. So this is again when you say mod z greater than 1 by delta mind you that you, you are trying to find a sufficiently small delta if you take find a sufficiently small delta 1 by delta becomes sufficiently large if 1 by delta becomes sufficiently large mod z greater than 1 by delta is a sufficiently small neighborhood of the point at infinity this is this is the point you have to be careful about okay. So this is how you define uh, the an infinite limit for a function at infinity okay and for example this will help you to uh, uh, define when infinity is a pole for a function okay uh, for example if you take uh, uh, any polynomial right. So uh, so now we are through with all these three definitions okay so what we have done is we have we are we are able to think of infinity as a concrete point you are able to uh, have infinity in the uh, domain of definition of the function namely you can allow you can write f of infinity you can write the value of f at infinity 
and if you want f to be continuous at infinity it had better be limit z tends to infinity f of z okay and you also allow infinity to be a value of the function okay so the function can take the value infinity okay and the the way that is facilitated is because of these definitions okay now what we will see next is uh, using these definitions how you can treat infinity as an isolated singularity and classify uh, classify the kind of singularities namely look at what it means to say for a function to have uh, an essential singularity or a pool or an removable singularity at infinity okay that is what we are going to do next okay okay so um, what we will do now is uh, look at uh, uh, infinity as a singularity okay so so let me write that down uh, uh, infinity as a singular point so you want to look at infinity as a singular point for a function okay and of course uh, mind you we are only worried about isolated singularities okay so we are not going to the complicated case when infinity is a non isolated singularity okay so if infinity is an isolated singularity for the function it means that uh, whenever you say something is an isolated singularity of, of a function it means that there is a deleted neighborhood about that point where the function is analytic so it means that your function should be analytic in a deleted neighborhood of infinity and that means that your function should be analytic uh, and 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 you know by definition a deleted neighborhood of infinity is just a, the ex, uh, is something that should contain uh, uh, the exterior of a sufficiently large circle on the complex plane centered at the origin if you want okay and therefore uh, your function should be first of all defined at infinity i mean it should be defined in the sense that it should be defined outside uh, uh, a circle of la sufficiently large radius okay so uh, so that's a prerequisite okay mind you because if you want to study a function at a point that point even if it is not a good point for the function it may be a singularity for the function the function should be uh, defined in a deleted neighborhood of that point I mean this applies even to very simple things like continuous functions see if you want to uh, talk about the continuity of a function at a point then you know uh, you need to study the function close to that point and look at what happens to the limit of the function as you approach that point therefore in a deleted neighborhood of, function, of that point the function should be defined in the same way okay the prerequisite for studying infinity as a singular point is that a function should be analytic in a deleted neighborhood of infinity which means that it should be defined on for mod z greater than r for r sufficiently large okay so uh, so let me write that down we 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 start with uh, 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 an analytic function analytic or holomorphic uh, an analytic function f of z uh, which is uh, defined in a deleted neighborhood so i'm using nbd for neighborhood of of infinity that is a defined and analytic for uh, mod z greater than r for r sufficiently large okay mind you this also includes the case of an entire function all i am saying is that the function should be defined outside a uh, yeah, circle or sufficiently large radius but i'm not saying it need not be defined inside the circle okay so um, what i am interested is only uh, the behavior of the function outside uh, at all points outside a circle of sufficiently large radius because that's that for me is what a neighborhood of infinity is okay um, so by definition you know by the definition of uh, singularity infinity becomes a singularity because what's a singularity a singularity is a point for a singularity is defined only for an analytic function and our definition of singularity is that it is a point which can be ap approached by points where the function is analytic so there must be and we are interested in isolated singularity so you see uh, if you take uh, the deleted neighborhood of uh, infinity uh, mod z greater than r is a deleted neighborhood of infinity if you if you take only com the the, the uh, finite complex plane i mean the com only the complex numbers and of course if you 
if you take mod z greater than r in the uh, in the extended complex plane you are also including the point at infinity okay uh, which by the way is also an open set with infinity as an interior point on the extended complex plane okay um, now you see you would have done this so i'm i'm trying to uh, bring your attention back to something that you should have seen in a first course in complex analysis uh, normally uh, the, uh, the the philosophy is that if you want to study f of z at infinity you will study f of 1 by z at 0 and uh, for the obvious reason that as, as z tends to 0 1 by z goes to infinity which you can now make sense of uh, because of our definitions okay. Um, well um, you know uh, the question is why is this uh, 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 why is this the right thing to do okay so you should ask yourself why uh, certain things are defined in a certain way uh, or what the uh, what is the philosophy behind these things so you can ask this question uh, what is the justification for saying that studying f of z at z equal to infinity is the same as studying f of 1 by z at z equal to 0 you can ask this question so this this comes to uh, this this brings us to something uh, interesting it is got to do with uh, uh, this this idea that you know uh, 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 when you say two objects are isomorphic okay then uh, properties of the objects uh, uh, should also correspond okay so this is a very general philosophy in mathematics you, if, if you have two isomorphic objects okay uh, e, 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 both of them should have the same type of property okay because an isomorphism is, an isomorphism is supposed to preserve the property uh, preserve all properties okay so for example if you have two groups and they are isomorphic uh, you cannot expect uh, one of them to be abelian the other is not the other non abelian okay you cannot expect such things because an isomorphism carries an abelian group only to an abelian group okay so in the same way this also applies to spaces so if you have two spaces let us say topological spaces if two topological spaces are isomorphic which means that they are homeomorphic then all the topological properties of one space should uh, agree with all the corresponding topological properties of the other space for example if, if two topological spaces are homeomorphic if one is connected then the other is also connected if one is not connected the other cannot be connected if one is compact the other is compact okay and so on and so forth so the fact is that there are properties which are supposed to be intrinsic properties these are called intrinsic properties uh, for an object and they are called intrinsic because they will not change if you change the object up to isomorphism okay for example uh, we say that the nature uh, the the, na the, na the abelian nature of a group okay uh, is an intrinsic property because if you replace the group by an isomorphic group then it will happen that the uh, replaced group will also have to be abelian because an isomorphism carries an abelian group to an abelian group okay so we say the the property of being abelian is an intrinsic property so in the same way uh, this also extends not only to properties of objects it also extends to pro properties of functions defined on objects this is the very important thing okay so so i'll give you i'll give you an example see um, so so uh, uh, so suppose uh, uh, suppose uh, phi from uh, x to y is a uh, homeomorphism which means that you know this is a uh, so I am putting a tilde above the arrow to signify that this arrow is actually an isomorphism a topological isomorphism which is otherwise called a homeomorphism okay and of course you know uh, uh, as I just told you all properties of x should correspond to same properties intrinsic properties of y but uh, what I want to say is that this also carries over to functions so you know see sub, suppose z is another topological space okay and suppose f from y to z is a function okay is a set theoretic map okay i can ask this question as to when f is continuous okay after all a, y and z are topological spaces and f is a set theoretic map and i can always ask when a set theoretic map between topological spaces is continuous okay now the fact is that you know i can complete this diagram by into a triangle by drawing this arrow which is the composition of uh, phi followed by f so it's uh, first apply phi then apply f and then I put a circular arrow like this to tell you that this circular arrow that I drawn inside the triangle is supposed to uh, uh, be uh, it's supposed to call uh, be called as commutativity of the diagram okay which is often used in algebra it just tells you that 
you know uh, if you go from x to z either via uh, going first through phi and then through f or from x to z by uh, the, the other map that I have written which is actually f circle phi they are one and the same okay. So uh, the advantage of this circular arrow is that sometimes I can write g here instead of writing f circle phi phi I can simply write g and then in, and if I put the circular arrow it means that this g is supposed to mean uh, f circle phi okay that is what it means okay. Now the question is that I am trying to state the obvious thing you can as you can expect you see that f is continuous if and only if g is continuous okay. The reason is because phi is a uh, isomorphism it is a homeomorphism okay. See so let me write that down clearly uh, f is continuous if and only if g is and, and the reason is because you can you can use uh, you can use the fact that a composition of continuous functions is continuous and you can use the fact that phi being a homeomorphism has an inverse uh, its inverse is rather uh, actually continuous okay. So you can get from f to g you can get from g back to f okay. So uh, the way of course you know the way of going from f to g it is just g is just f circle phi and how do you go from g to f you you well you you apply uh, you apply first uh, phi inverse and then you apply g you will get f okay. So f is uh, first applying phi inverse and then applying g okay. Well if you write if you if you write it down uh, remembering that g is equal to f circle phi what you will get is that f it will just simplify to f circle phi circle phi inverse which is uh, since uh, composition of maps is associative uh, I can change the brackets I will get f circle f circle phi circle phi inverse and that is f circle well phi followed by phi inverse is supposed to give me the identity on x so this will be f circle identity on x and uh, first if I apply identity on x oops uh, no it is first applying phi inverse uh, uh, and then phi so it is not identity on x it should be identity on y. Uh, and f circle identity y is just f okay. So um, yeah so that is uh, I am just trying to write out algebraically that f is just g circle phi inverse. Um, so f is continuous if and only if g is that is obvious okay. Now uh, you know you, now this this uh, this can you can take this over and do it to not only to continuous functions you can do it to differentiable functions you can do it to analytic functions and so on and so forth. So for example uh, you look at a different situation suppose phi is uh, an analytic isomorphism okay it is a uh, it is a holomorphic isomorphism of one domain in the complex plane to another domain in the complex plane okay. So then a, a function on the target domain a complex valued function on the target domain is holomorphic or analytic if and only if the composition with phi is holomorphic on the or analytic on the source domain okay. See if you look at this diagram what it says is that f is a function on the target which is y and f is continuous if and only if its composition with the isomorphism phi is going to give you a continuous function on the source okay. So we, we often you, in algebraic notation we always say that f is actually pulled back to g okay we say f is a the pullback of f is g okay and by pullback what you mean is that you compose f with the isomorphism so that you get a, a function on the source and that is why it is called pullback because you are taking a function from the target a function defined on the target and you are from that you are cooking up a function on the source and all you have to do is compose with the isomorphism from the source to the target. And for that matter, you don't even need an isomorphism. Even if you had a morphism, this will work. Okay, so 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 let me write that down. Uh, uh, suppose uh, uh, phi from uh, d one to d two uh, is yeah uh, is an analytic isomorphism of domains. in the complex plane so mind you uh, phi it, it means that d of course you know I am assuming d1 and d2 are non-empty uh, they are open connected sets their domains and they are isomorphic by 
a map phi which is an analytic or holomorphic isomorphism what it means is that it is basically it is a it is an analytic map which is one to one okay. You have this deep theorem which says the open mapping theorem which says that the image of a non-constant analytic map is always open and you also have this theorem that uh, that the an injective analytic map is a holomorphic isomorphism namely its inverse is also going to be uh, the inverse is also going to be holomorphic okay. So, uh, saying that phi is an analytic isomorphism is the same as saying that uh, phi is analytic and phi is injective okay. So, so let me write that down that is phi is analytic and injective. Now you can now I can say the same thing if f is a complex valued holomorphic function uh, a complex valued function on d2 then f is holomorphic or analytic if and only if f circle phi is holomorphic or analytic okay the same the same argument applies okay. So uh, clearly if f uh, from d2 to c uh, is a function f is analytic uh, if and only if uh, uh, g is equal to f circle phi is analytic okay. So, the philosophy is the same okay and now I now I want you to now I want to give you the justification as to why uh, the studying f at infinity is the same as studying f of 1 by z at 0 that is because the map is not going to 1 by z that is the and that is what phi stands for in our particular case that is a that is an isomorphism it is a homeomorphism and uh, and uh, from the uh, <coughs> punctured plane to the punctured plane it is a holomorphic isomorphism okay and that gives you the justification that studying f at infinity is the same as f of z at infinity is the same as studying f of 1 by z at at, uh, at 0 and the, the z going to 1 by z is the ta takes the role of phi okay. So, I will stop here.